Hey folks, Arm and Hammer here. You are about to watch a brand new episode of The Sand Podcast. On this episode, we talk about who is the greatest female CrossFitter of all time. There's a brand new Mr. Olympia after eight years. And of course, a lot of time spent on Neil Jordan's epic thriller, The Crying Game. Check it out. Let me know what you think. Welcome to this episode of Sweating About news feeds that that is my job that yeah. might be the most accurate mm-hmm. this is true I don't know about the feeds part. i don't know what a news feed is i'm yeah. sweating about news sure that's definitely the foundation of armin's youtube channel Correct. right mm-hmm. now is sweating about news feeds that's certainly what the crossfit community is doing right yeah. now they are sweating it and they're sweating it hard that's right we are we're leaning real deep into the uh the pain mm. the stress mm-hmm. the hurt that everyone is feeling emotionally and spiritually over yeah. the lack of regionals now <laughs> i'm Wait, sorry uh, did Chase. you shout out who's who gave us that name that that this is the first time i think we've actually pulled something off of youtube oh, so mm. that goes uh from dennis cook nice. who's commenting on our last episode on Hell youtube yeah, dennis cook thanks Hell dennis yeah. cook really appreciate it bro thank you for watching the long form video content that's right on arm and hammer tv that's right so um you know, not much has happened between the last time that we spoke and this time in terms of news. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of CrossFit news. In terms of yes, CrossFit that's news, right. that's right. Um, you know, I, we know I, that President Trump's wiener looks like Toad from Mario Kart. Yep. Do that's we really? What we've found that's what yeah, Stormy, Stormy Daniel, Daniel says. Daniel. Really? Yes. How do what does that, what does that Apparently, mean? Apparently, Mario Kart was trending on Twitter because of Trump's penis. That was a thing. I only have heard that peripherally, so I don't have a lot more to say about it. But apparently, I'm trying to envision the headline that I got was Stormy Daniels said that Trump's wiener looks Mm -hmm. like a toadstool, not toad from Mario Kart. Uh, But I think that then became a meme, and as a result, Mario Kart ended up a lot of Mario Kart oriented memes uh, emerged, and Mario Kart ended up trending on uh, Twitter as a result of um, Trump's dingus. So it's cute. I think it's cute. I think it's spotted is what it's she's cute saying. and it's fast. It it's has little red quick. spots very all over the head. Well, yeah, the best acceleration. Well, you you two guys, as big fans of Mario Kart, mm-hmm. will you ever be able to uh, pick Toad as character again mm-hmm. I only without making Trump penis jokes? I only play as Black Shy Guy. Yeah, <laughs> Chase, Chase plays with the most uh, appropriate character black shy guy <laughs> um, wait uh, what shy guy is that was that on mario 64 or is this some sort of post mario 64 a- edition uh, character? i'm not sure exactly where shy guy is Same. from which one of the marios he's from but shy yeah. guy, he looks kind of like a he looks kind of like a ghost because i don't he has like a hood yeah i just really don't remember that face. being a character on mario 64 no no he's not he's not one of like the main, main oh, okay thing. he's oh, like okay. he's like some you, sort of you. side character somewhere gotcha, i don't gotcha, exactly gotcha. know where shy guy's from i played as yoshi all the way because cool. i felt like he was faster i i have wrong <laughs> i've been playing uh i play when i play mario kart my favorite connect character is tanuki, tanuki <laughs> which is tanuki mario the raccoon suit mario uh-huh. and Nothing. i just like him because every time he wins he looks at the camera shakes his ass and goes uh. tanuki you guys are definitely playing a later iteration. None of these things were available back yeah. in, in, in 1985 more. when I was playing Mario Kart oh, on the is, Nintendo 64. This is 64. the newest, new, uh, newest Mario Kart. Nothing my dreams by a decade. more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or nightmares. More than a decade. Than Tanuki Mario shaking his ass as I lose. One day I'm just going to I'm gonna break <laughs> into your house and I'm going <laughs> to wake you up by whispering Tanuki into your uh, ear. That's nice. It's, I'll probably already be awake from the nightmare. It's going to be like, <laughs> it's gonna be like uh, uh, something out of jackass you're gonna wake up and just slam your head right into my ass but i'm wearing like a raccoon suit it's gonna be great i can't wait i really can't wait it's gonna be wonderful um yeah so apparently that's a thing i did not know that i honestly had not heard that that's yes. news to me um let's talk about other penises um <laughs> go on listen that's a good segue for something that's no, happening no, no, no. later we're gonna talk what? about we're gonna talk oh. about that later uh l- before we get there let's put a pin in that uh before we get there uh the uh, Noah Olson saved yep. somebody's life. Bro, a oh, that's yeah. right. Uh, so the ultimate Hawaii trail run. I don't know. Were they you in guys desperate need of, of just like someone who was really yoked, and he like flexed <laughs> so hard on them that it brought them back to life. So I I, I texted him because I heard about this story, uh, and the reason why I heard about the story, by the way, is because. Noah posted like this this picture of him sort of like looking out into the distance 
at the Hawaii Trail Run, like covered in mud and like mm-hmm. sitting on this like giant mud covered tractor tire. Mm-hmm. And he was like, "Man, this year's Hawaii Trail Run like really learned a lot about myself out there." <laughs> and Matthew like, Fraser, shut up. <laughs> Matthew Fraser commented on it and said, "It was a walk for f- it was a walk through the j- through mud for four hours. What did you learn about yourself? <laughs> it was a four hour, four hour <laughs> trot through the woods. It was a four hour trot through the woods. <laughs> what, what did, did you, you learn about, about yourself?" yourself? And, uh-huh. uh, you know, that sort of that sort of like good natured shit talking is exactly what this world needs more of. Uh-huh. And uh-huh. that's the mm-hmm. sand stamp of approval. Yeah. That's right. A lot of more uh, shit talking. A lot of white knights out there jumped in and were like, maybe you should have been there or you <laughs> would have seen what it's all about. And Matthew Fridge was like, I was there. <laughs> you morons! I, I was, I was winning. I was there. I won the uh, thing. It wasn't even. It was not a competition. It was a charity event. Uh, I won the thing. Yeah, anyway, yeah. and then someone commented about something like, "Oh, you know, no Olson stopped and saved somebody's life while you just ran right by them as they were dying." <laughs> and I was like, "That that sounds like there might be a nugget of truth to that, yeah, actually." Yeah. So. Uh, I texted no, Noah. No, the, the problem is how they ended up. Uh, how they ended up, their life was imperiled when Matt Fraser just fucking elbowed him in the boat on the way, <laughs> like on the way, vaulting in. them through a mud yes. pit, like face planting them as he frogs <laughs> over them. The problem is there was an obstacle, but Matt knew that the most efficient way to get through it was to grab the other person above his head and throw them through <laughs> the implement <laughs> and break it before him. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So apparently Noah. Uh, so I texted Noah for details on this and, and I think the story made it on into the morning chocolate, but here's what he said. I, I asked him, I was like, dude, I, I hear you help save someone's life in Hawaii. And he goes, man, I don't know if I'd say that, but it was really crazy. I did think this dude was going to die in my arms. <laughs> <laughs> and he followed that up by saying he had heat exhaustion and was dehydrated mm. in and out of consciousness. Me and another dude pulled him off the trail. After a while, the medic showed up and thought his heart was going to stop at one point. Mm. We had to carry him down like three kilometers and Holy then shit. and then eventually got him on a stretcher functional and fitness. thankfully he's okay and i was nice. like holy shit god that so, guy could have benefited from matt fraser carrying him he would have got there a lot quicker yeah oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's beautiful roasted M- uh, matt fraser is going matt fraser is going to return victory matt, Fr- matt will return to that course and then he'll uh, post a video of himself carrying a larger man the same distance <laughs> faster and he'll be like hashtag #impossible workout <laughs> yeah so Rude. congratulations to no olsen for saving somebody's life uh, that was really cool that is very fucking very cool. cool very fucking cool so uh that's that's really nice to see and apparently this hawaii trail run deal is like fun everybody big got deal. invited yeah everyone I'm goes assuming ours got lost it's fine that's yeah. right that's right our our invitation was lost in the mail so so was it more of an year, obstacle course or was it more as like a run thing it or? is it looks like a giant like muddy like F- mm. like 7k loop that cool. you just redo over and over again for a long time with running a bunch of circles? like different obstacles I, like I think i guess it's wrong i don't know if it's running in circles but it seems like it's, it's running in circles i don't know if everybody was barefoot but sam dancer was barefoot god damn right he was of course mm-hmm. he was and sam his nails were t- toenails were painted right yes most likely they better have been sam is, he contains multi gorilla he posted yeah. a picture of his feet it was they're quite disturbing. Yeah, his yeah. his uh, his toes. I saw it. they're very far so spread out. Yeah, they, yeah. they articulate like yeah. like mm. their fingers. Mm-hmm. They can grab the ground and yeah. snatch two eighty five barefoot. I think that's I think that's what it is. I think honestly, yeah. it's like you spend that much time barefoot and you get that fit being barefoot. Your feet just kind of adapt into gorilla feet. Maybe that's mm-hmm. maybe that's how our feet are oh, wait, supposed to be, and our well, feet are just atrophied into these little weird did you ever watch toed thingies. Uh, Dual survival with that uh, Cody. I think it's Cody Lundin. He's um, always barefoot. Huh. He was like there with like a Marine or like Navy SEAL or some shit. And that dude was like super serious, hard ass. And this guy was just a hippie that was barefoot everywhere. Mm. But he never complained. Nice. He's always barefoot, no matter the terrain. Mm. Didn't it's matter. It's fucking cool. He's a badass. Barefoot is, from is Arizona or Texas. Is real deal Evander Holyfield stuff, man. I mean, it's like you've got to you've got to really commit to that lifestyle. That's one of those things you don't go halfway on. Like you can you can like fake a diet for a couple mm-hmm. days. But if you try and fake the barefoot life for a couple <laughs> days, you're like getting tetanus. You yeah. know, your feet are gonna be black and gross and dirty from like the asphalt. Mm-hmm. It pr- the burned problem, here yeah, the in Texas. The problem is where you live. If you live in any kind Manhattan. of city <laughs> or place where there's concrete, that ain't gonna work. My you suggestion, need to live on dirt. No, no. My yeah. suggestion is do the opposite. If you live inside of a concrete jungle, that's the only time with which you should be barefoot all the time i think uh downtown I think la downtown that way Manhattan. the yeah. hiv needles on the ground <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's san francisco we're gonna remove you right um, from the breeding pool but that 
I think that you got to fully commit. It's not just about having your feet bare all the time. It's about because if you're just dressed like a normal person, feet bare doesn't look right. So you got to go feet bare. You got to be wearing nothing but a pair of muddy overalls, big straw hat, and like be holding a catfish by the mouth, <laughs> and then <laughs> you're good to go. I, no one will question that. No, you need to be holding a block of ice yes. held together with string. From the Ice Man down the street. That's right. You're trying to get it to the farmhouse yes. before it melts. <laughs> yes, you so need 100 percent not possible for us now. Yes, because Texas is fucking hot. Yes. Well, the bigger the ice, did you know? You know that actually they. Uh, I hate this part of the show. By the way, some people have said. Some people have said that. Uh, some sort of some people. Uh, uh, some uh, scientist was basically saying that they uh, came up with a plan to basically move a glacier to Africa saying that it would lose a significant amount of its mass on you know in route to Africa but it would be a way to like get a bunch of uh, fresh water to arid areas you could actually transport a glacier to Africa in the water then I guess that move it across land or something I don't know like if that. you guys watch Spongebob but that sounds like some <laughs> bullshit Patrick came up with that's like uh, take old this ice, iceberg and move it over there yeah, yeah. <laughs> that dude that dude took took one too many puffs of whatever yeah. the fuck he was smoking before deciding that maybe the best move is to just like, why don't we just pick up an ice sheet and yeah. put it on the middle of the desert? That should help. They just got to be careful about the spaceships with the space, uh, the uh, shape-shifting critters. That's right. Them. That's damn, no man. doubt going to emerge. That's that right. The, the toughest part about that is the uh, flesh-eating super viri that live mm-hmm. within the ice that you're going to be melting and spreading across Africa. Yeah. That's what killed the dinosaurs. That's yep. right. It's really fucked up. It's really fucked up that you'd want to do that, scientist man. How dare you? So Mr. fitness. Scientist. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, fitness. Uh, and we're super so busy. News you want to share? Ooh. I have not. I have yeah, not. Those, those facts? <laughs> I don't have any super secret news that I can share. Ooh, I've, I've, that I, hurts that you can share. <laughs> So I've I uh, I've heard some rumors. I've mm-hmm. heard some rumors, such as uh, Bikes. the the team series mm-hmm. just started tonight, right? It just yeah. started tonight. Yeah, we just got the first four words. I heard registration at the team series is a lot lower than it has been in the past. Mm-hmm. Who gives a shit? The team series is a waste of time yeah. anyway. Does That's the going away, right? I hope so. Good. It's definitely one of those things that should. Well, it has to go actually because now super teams are just. The, the 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 affiliate right. cup is basically the team series. Right. Same also, thing it's, now. it's like it's the middle of September. There's no way they're going to do the team yeah. series two weeks before the open starts. Yeah. So yeah. this is probably right the last ever time. team series. But couldn't they make more participation by just announcing the winner of the team series gets an automatic qualification to the games? Hey, Fuck ooh. yeah, they could. But they won't, unfortunately. Yeah. It's also, part of the it would have regime. to be like the top two, and it'd be like, that's how we're picking two of the teams. Mm-hmm. Right. Per- just, <laughs> just pairing them together. Here's the best men's <laughs> men's teams and the best women's women. That's actually not a bad idea. Yeah. It's like something out of a bad movie. I like that. <laughs> like The winning team for the women is in like Australia, and then the like winning team for the men's in Nashville. Not Nashville. Cookville, Tennessee. And they just have Close to work enough. together. Mm-hmm. Plus a turnout that, uh, you know, two of them used to be boyfriend and girlfriend and haven't spoken to each other in years. There are going to be all sorts of personality clashes. There we go. Now it's we're, be a, now we're building a movie, this plot. Really. Making the team. Um, <laughs> the new CrossFit <laughs> HQ TV show. Fuck. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Don't give them any ideas. Um, you know, I, I released a video uh, earlier this week about who's the greatest female CrossFitter of all time. Mm-hmm. And... And uh, I narrowed it down to, <laughs> what's that look, Chase? Why are you giving that look to the just camera? Just happened to be Annie Thor's daughter's birthday. Just saying. Oh, oh fuck! It no. was that was an accident, by yeah. the way. Huh. That was an accident. It took it, it was it took me a long time to film that. I did not know when her birthday was. <laughs> that I was just incredible because you yeah. nailed it. I just happened to release it on her birthday. Spoiler uh-huh. alert: My pick for the greatest female crossfitter of all time is Annie Thor's daughter. And mm-hmm. I Brown. know I know now <laughs> that there's plenty of people who um, don't watch any of my videos <laughs> and then comment uh-huh. because there was like dozens of people who were like, fuck you, you know, Tia is going to, Tia is actually the goat, even though I addressed it. And they're like, yeah, yeah. she won, she's won twice and she's been on the podium two times and like, she's the greatest by far, mm-hmm. this, that. I'm like, guys, like I, you didn't, you didn't even watch the video. Like I actually said like, Hey, it's super fucking close, but mm-hmm. because of, you know, X, Y, and Z reasons, 
Tia is going to be the greatest of all. There's no doubt that she will be the greatest of all time. Mm-hmm. There's some doubt. We don't know what can happen. Well, I guess that's a good year. point. She could be Skiing. cut in half tomorrow. That's yeah. right. She could be. She, she could be could, final she, destinationed. I just want to point I, out. I don't agree with any of these yeah. views or points. But I want to point out, Tia, I don't <laughs> want you to be cut in half just you know so you know, just stay this away from things like making it sound like you do more just i <laughs> stay away from things like like sawmills and or um trash compactors or log splitters or industrial paper cutters guillotines <laughs> and or if you see an elevator doors that are open and the elevator is halfway up just let it go don't get in <laughs> just let it go don't <laughs> get in take the next one take the next elevator tia listen hashtag tia Dude, don't oh, get cut in half no hold on a second you, you didn't you didn't say it tia take the next elevator take the next elevator tia. take lift, the next lift, elevator. Not the elevator take the next lift tia uh, don't I, get I, cut in half have tia. you seen tia's midsection i have no doubt that it would break the would elevator. Break the building, <laughs> the, just the building would shred around her and she'd just and, rise and out no, of no, the An crumbs. elevator can cut off Michael Ironside's arms this and his true. arms are made of iron because that's, that's his name. Yeah. <laughs> See you at the party, Tia. <laughs> Car- carbon steel versus iron uh, arms. Uh, I think you made some good points, man. Annie, Annie has definitely got my vote for the GOAT. Yeah. It's, well, it's a kind of thing where... Uh, you know, watch the video. I think that Tia does have the does have those finishes, and arguably Tia's finishes. I I not say arguably, inarguably, Tia's two second place finishes are you know in a much more competitive field than when than all of Annie's various podium things. But uh, but you know, Annie, why not? Fuck yeah, it, I, I mean the, the the it really was a toss up. I, I if you if you uh, if you look in my notes, I actually mm-hmm. wrote two different versions of this video one mm. that ended with me saying tia was the greatest of all time and one which ended <laughs> with me shit. saying Annie saying was the greatest of all time uh, an extended cut directors version? and i and i had to alternate I had to ending make a decision at one point and here's here's what the deciding factor was for me paleness. uh was that the plumbus <laughs> <laughs> yes but also the paleness <laughs> that's right uh here's here's the deciding factor for me Annie Thor's fuck daughter. Fuck Australia? Was that it? <laughs> <laughs> was fuck Australia the thing? That prison island. Uh, I like you, Australia. A bunch of backwards fucking people. <laughs> <laughs> that is rude. Uh, here's what decided it for me. What decided for me was that Annie emerged onto CrossFit in a way that Tia and her had something in common, which was the moment we saw them compete, we're like, they're not just future champions, but they're changing the way that CrossFit mm-hmm. is going to be competitive on the women's side yep. but annie w- did that 10 fucking years ago mm-hmm. and, it's and still. is still like she yep. took podium last year yep. she's still getting onto the podium after like back injuries after dropping out of the games from like nearly dying during murph like the the roller coaster of her career yeah. and what she's been able to after, do after at 19 years old she would have won the crossfit games that year were it not for a rule that did not that has not existed in any subsequent crossfit games which is if you dnf one workout you're out of the competition completely which when she was unable to get a muscle up she dnf that workout and it knocked her out i believe in the point is that spread what it was? Yeah. in point spread she would have she still beat ended up Tanya s- Wagner yeah. uh, in that year so she would have walked into the CrossFit Games albeit a very different CrossFit Games at the time and won had it not been for that rule there which is a relevant factor yeah, and, and I think something that Annie did that T is you know on the verge of doing but obviously mm-hmm. this is because Iceland is a much smaller space um, but Annie came into CrossFit did her first snatch and her first muscle up yep. at the CrossFit Games like she she came to the games not knowing what the fuck it was. There was a max snatch event. Bergner, Coach Bergner, like mm-hmm. pulled her aside and was like, "Have you ever snatched before?" And she's like, "I don't even know what that is." <laughs> He's like, "Okay, it looks like this." And then she went and maxed out her snatch. And yeah. then there was muscle ups in the last event. She snatched three hundred and forty five <laughs> pounds. By the <laughs> way, to be fair, <clears throat> if I ever meet Coach Bergner, no matter how good I've gotten at snatch, the I'm answer is go, you've never snatched I've before. I've never snatched before. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, before the last event where there's muscle ups, Greg Glassman pulls her aside and says, have you ever done a muscle up before? And she's like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> and then he taught her how to do a muscle up and she got it on the floor yeah, uh, yeah. during that event. So it's like there's there's this history with it. And then she brought it back to Iceland and essentially started this like she planted the seed that became CrossFit in Europe. Mm-hmm. And that, I think, is something that you can't 
you can't overlook. And she should also uh, be called the greatest of all time for simply this reason. Uh, I think it was 2010, the same... Yeah, it was 2010, the year that all the regionals... It was when the, it was the year that sectionals existed, but all the regional competitions were different. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think, again, Faster was doing a bunch of video content that year, going around and shooting a bunch of the different regionals, and I think this was from that. And uh, Annie was competing in the uh, the regional contest, and they just basically had a camera following her around the whole time you know, as she was doing it. And this happened in one of the videos where she's doing chest-to-bar pull-ups, and the judge counts a chest-to-bar pull-up, and she drops down, and she's like, no... She was like, my chest didn't touch. And she calls her own no rep and then still just just walks away just from the rest of the, the field. field. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And for that reason alone, her smiling face, her honesty. Iceland Annie. Her That's turtle right. shell. Iceland Annie is the goat. Now, yeah. listen, next year, if Tia wins or gets second place again next year, mm-hmm. I think we can pretty easily sit down and have this same conversation yes. except say that Tia Clartumi has taken over the title. Yeah, yeah. Because... You know, the just the capacity that she's shown and the boundaries that she's pushing in human performance mm-hmm. is pretty fucking gnarly. Yep. You know, both Annie and Tia have competed at the world stage at uh, in weightlifting. Mm-hmm. You know, Annie has represented Iceland at world championships. Mm-hmm. Tia's represented Australia at world championships. But Tia not only went to the Olympics, but she's a Commonwealth champion, which is a big deal. Mm-hmm. Commonwealth is like one of the three or four largest meets in the world. Yep. Um, so that's a that's a really, really big deal. And mm-hmm. so I think there's definitely these like, you know, uh, the way I, I laid it out in the in the video was essentially like just looking at their storylines. Like Annie is the OG. She like set the tone for everybody. Katrin has like this really crazy Hollywood story where she like did shitty, shitty mm-hmm failed to qualify like in front of everybody and then came back to win it twice in a row right after that. And then Tia is just kind of like, she was like the prodigy. She was like the chosen one from Mm -hmm. the get go. She's and, an Anakin Skywalker. And she changed. Yeah. She was able to like prove how important she's mindset Hayden is. She's Christensen of CrossFit. But uh, a better actor. Yes. Yes. She's on the <laughs> council, but she is not a master. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Prequel uh, memes. Uh, so, you know, I think, I think it's important to, to have Sand those conversations. Rough. Mainly because <laughs> I hate shout sand. Out. Shout out subreddit prequel it gets, memes. It gets everywhere. That's right. Shout out prequel memes. Um, uh, anyways, there. so <laughs> a surprise to be sure, but a welcome one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, man. You guys, the fact that I work at home, you're literally sitting in my kitchen office. Yep. Uh, means that I have my coffers. I have Mm -hmm. been I have been consuming so much goddamn media over the past three (laughs) months. You have no idea, Uh, and a lot of it is stuff that I've already seen. Um, in one way or another, like it's not like I'm doing things like, oh, I'm gonna catch up and watch all of Black Mirror mm -hmm. or something, or I'm gonna watch Barry, which you guys have been recommending. Man, you still haven't. Instead, I sit here and I'm like, what the fuck's going on in prequel memes? So. Uh, you need to get off Reddit and get on to watching some goddamn Barry because, uh, Yo, yeah, just at the Emmy, really, yeah. Uh, Henry Winkler won an Emmy, and uh, Bill Hader won an Emmy, uh, shocking the world by beating out Atlanta in those uh, categories. Yeah, so, I've got to, uh, I've got to check it out. I heard that. about that. I heard about that. Um, and uh, I have not seen much Atlanta. I think I've seen like the first couple episodes. It seems good, but Barry is fucking extraordinary. Mm-hmm. So get on it. Is it extraordinary? It's extraordinary. I hate. Everything about this exchange. <laughs> <Doors? laughs> yeah. Uh yeah, so I think I think uh in terms of the fitness world, we have a we have a very strange lull right now. Things are quiet on the mm-hmm. official front. There's a fitness adjacent bit of news. This past weekend we have a new Mr. Olympia. Yes. For the first time in what, eight years? Flexatron. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. We have a Flexatron, Sean Roden. Mm. Uh, I don't even know who that is. Dude, he's huge. Well, he's yeah. the one who won. Well, I I don't I don't I've never seen him before. I don't know. Well it, he's he's very muscular. Oh, okay. <laughs> Shocker. He's wow. a very low body fat percentage. Uh, well, don't worry. You didn't see it this year, but he'll probably win seven times in a row, as <laughs> is tradition. As bodybuilders do. Yes. But Phil Heath took runner-up? Phil Heath yep. took runner-up. Wow. He was going, Phil Heath has seven. He was going for eight, which would have tied him with Ronnie Coleman and Lee Haney for the record. Jay but, Cutler uh, has seven as well, right? No. No, no Jay four. Cutler has like four, yeah. Damn. Yeah. Yeah, Jay Cutler didn't run for much consecutive. He was fighting Ronnie Coleman for much of that. But I think that the sucks. Sean Roden thing is probably a one-off because Sean Roden's 43 years old. He's been around for a while. This might be a Dexter Jackson type thing where he you know, happens to show up in perfect shape one year and the champ wasn't in great shape. That said, 
who knows if Phil Heath will win next year because we have people are talking about Kai Green returning. Mm-hmm. People are talking what about what the fuck. Yeah, yeah. he's I'm, been out for a while. What you mean Stranger Things season two's Kai yeah. Green? Yeah. I, I honestly have no idea. In the bodybuilding world, I feel like ten years mm-hmm. pass. And the same fucking people Names. are still competing. It's because mm. the drugs keep them young, Armin. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I don't understand. The drugs it. do it. Kai Green hasn't competed at Olympia in what three years? Something like that. Yeah, he's still huge. He's, he's still gigantic. in shape. Yeah. He is not. He's not shrunken at all. He just he didn't compete literally because he doesn't think the judging is fair and didn't think they would mm-hmm. give it to anyone but Phil. Yeah. Well, that uh, that turned that uh, turned that myth on its head. There, it turns point. out he was oh, just a fuck. myth on its head, though. <laughs> feel like it's very much so yeah. just like that in that that community word yeah the uh yeah but um oh here let's pause for a second that was i'm i'm visibly shook if you keep that on there oh that's that's staying on there for sure chase you're saying that the judging at the olympia isn't fair or yeah recording? i'm saying that shit's mad bias oh, yeah it explains why people win over and over they're like i like that body Oh, it's back. Mm-hmm. I like it still. Yeah. Oh, it's back. I like it still. I don't know why I'm picking this guy over this guy. Mm. All muscles look the same. Well, I mean, that's <laughs> what happens when you have a sport that is entirely subjective. Yeah. Right? Like you yeah. can just be like uh you can you can entirely fall into human, you know, uh habit. You're like, "Oh, well, I mean, Phil is Mr. Olympia, mm. right?" So, mm-hmm. you know, you've got to be, like, way better than him in order to win. So, like, how do you yeah, even yeah. measure that? Well, I would say that, though, that there's a difference between a sport that's entire, uh, something that's entirely subjective and something that is judge-dependent. Because you have upsets in the UFC because of judging and that sort of thing. But one can't really say that, you know, there's, there's the, the lack of subjective standards, but there's a, a, more, a greater margin for error because there are judges involved. Where, and I think something like bodybuilding, which contains an aesthetic component is also more similar to say something like gymnastics where taste and a margin for error exist though there are objective criterion by which people are judged and there's definitely objective criterion in bodybuilding cliff will now elaborate on that oh sure there's all the various mandatory poses you're comparing everyone against each other there's in side by side comparisons you can see pr- there's pretty clear consensus about who has the best rear double biceps is the lower back in or the glutes striated, all of that. Yeah. Glute striations it, are hugely important there. Yep. Yeah. If your glutes aren't striated, you don't have a chance. I want to see Chase on like three times a human level of testosterone uh, being exogenously injected and just see, let's see how jacked we can get Chase. Chase is, Chase is six inches too tall to be a bodybuilder. This is true, but let's just see how far we can take him. Yeah, no, let's push Chase to the limit. Let's turn I don't like, him. I don't like this experiment. Let's turn also, Chase into a human petri dish. Wait, that's not what I meant. <laughs> like, it's not what would happen. Like, you know what happened with Captain America? And you're like, you filled him up with steroids, and it's like, damn, that guy looks How good. How dare mm-hmm. you? It's you super saw this Hulk movie with uh, shit. With is it Timothy? O- Tim? Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Not all fan. It was abomination. Yeah. Oh, that's oh what with I the Edward like. Norton. You just uh, be like, oh wow, it doesn't work the same on everybody. <laughs> <laughs> It's just like, uh, like an unorthodox yeah, monster. It would be like the fly, yeah. except we'd call it the guy. And instead <laughs> of you getting into the like you know teleporter with a fly in it, you yeah. get into it with like Ronnie Coleman's hair in it or something. Yeah, <laughs> and you end up turning it's into full. a monster. <laughs> well, it's like when someone I shaves their, his head. Wait, hair. Wait. Yeah. It's like when someone shaves their head and realizes that they have a weird shaped head. It would be like if I got like super shredded, you'd realize that oh no, my abs aren't super square like those guys. It just looks like a bucket of eels down here, just all weird <laughs> angles that and things. That same reference. Bucket of eels. It's back. Bucket of eels That's is great. Back. Bucket of eels is back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I guess I guess in a weird way, um, I know very little about bodybuilding, yeah. and I'm okay with that. Yeah. I feel like I watched Pumping Iron. I watched mm-hmm. Pumping Iron 2, yep. and it wasn't as good as the first one. Generation I've, Iron. I've yeah. watched Generation Iron, which is really good. Yep. And then... Speaking of which, uh, uh, the star of uh, one of them, I don't remember which one, or one of the prominently featured uh, people, Calum Volner... Calum Von Moger or something like something that. Something like yeah. that. Uh, he's popular on Instagram. Uh, is portraying... Uh, the trailer just came out today. I texted it to you guys. He's portraying Arnold Schwarzenegger in a movie about the foundation of the Olympia, mm-hmm. I guess? Bigger. Oh, yes. About, about, Bigger. Just about 
Joe Weeder and yeah, the beginning of the Olympia and all Funk, that. Yeah. Also, we have Sergio Oliva Jr. in there who qualified for the Olympia for the first time, mm-hmm. playing his father, playing Sergio Oliva Sr. Mm. I can just see the featurettes on that Blu-ray already. Mm. It's like it was very important to me to play my father. He doesn't have an accent. He does doesn't he? have an accent. Is he Russian? I don't know. He, Is that the name you got from Sergio? Sergio? That's the ethnicity you went with. Sergio, Sergio probably Russian. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't feel wrong yeah, to an illiterate on. like I. Listen, if I had kept it going and I confidently portrayed it, you guys wouldn't have called me on Hello, it. Hello, my name like, is oh, Sergio. Okay. I am from Sicily. Hello, I am Sergio <laughs> Olivia. <laughs> I am from Sicily. I <laughs> like pasta. <laughs> but he did complain about that he got really peeled for the role, and uh-huh. they told him, you need to put a little more fat on yeah. because you guys in that era weren't that peeled. I love you know, that phrase. <laughs> got peeled. really peeled. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's close hip to the lingo. I um, I, one thing is I did, the other one. Grainy. By the way, one of the thing I one of the things I really did appreciate about the trailer is when it cuts to like a shot at the end of all of the guys flexing. They all did not at all look like modern bodybuilders. Like all the guys kind of had that much rounder more normal human physique of oh, this yeah. and i thought that like considering there probably a lot of the movie is going to be made to appeal to a bodybuilding audience and stuff i would have expected them to have just a bunch of shredded guys with fucking shredded abs and everything in there and while the guys are very very fit they really did look period appropriate you that's know? cool kind of cool. because arnold's body looks uh it almost looks like he weighs a hundred pounds less than <laughs> modern bodybuilders <laughs> Because maybe he actually fucking did. He sure did. Yeah, he actually he was the same as Phil Heath, though he's several inches taller. But yeah, yeah. Wait, you, mind you blown. You said I was several inches too tall. Hey, oh, yeah, I yeah. Think Ar- I see Ar- an Arnold, Arnold's like six one, six two, and there's mm-hmm. plenty of the cla- actually you you would be for the classic physique. Hell classic yeah. physique, their height classic. and weight requirements, but it tends to favor the taller guys. There you go. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's I, it. <laughs> By the way, if, what I'm doing next. If you guys want to follow a fun bodybuilding-oriented YouTube channel, uh, Reagan Grimes uh, posts a lot, and I watched one of his like contest prep things. It, it went on sound forever. Like a bodybuilder's name <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a really filthy porn star. <laughs> name. Yes. Uh, well, you know, there is a lot of skin. But and I don't really even follow. Bo- I don't follow bodybuilding at all. But it was interesting to see just how tedious the contest prep is for one of those things. <laughs> while he's like he's on the phone remotely with his coach, and he's just like alone in his hotel room before he goes out on a bot to run his contest. He's like, okay, um, like like he has his friend take pictures of his body. He texts them to his coach. He waits. He gets messages back from his coach. Okay, I'm allowed. I'm. I need to eat one half of one cookie <laughs> and then w- exactly one cup of creamed rice and he'll just like eat it and then go and then like uh, several hours later he'll text different pictures in his body like he's having to like inflate his muscles while keeping his water down and he's Jesus. like oh and I'm allowed to have like one third of one bottle of water and he's and it's just like and he's counting down to the thing it's like so weird and meticulous it really gives you a sense of uh of uh, just how much goes into the prep for one of those Yeah, things. it sounds so, miserable. Yes. Doesn't it sound miserable, Loki? Yes. She says yes. Loki the dog. Speaking of miserable, I think now's as good a time as <laughs> any to talk about the crying game. hey Hey! You yes, sir. Sir. fucking a man loves yeah. a woman! Yeah. 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 Um, uh, all right, well, she's so, not that either. You know, we have we have uh, <clears throat> we have plenty of time to talk about uh-huh. this this do movie. We? we do, and <laughs> I wanted I wanted to st- to preface this portion of this episode by saying thank you to everybody that listens to this show, uh-huh. and uh, for those of you who watched along with us, uh-huh. thank you for watching. Um, I may be the only person who felt this way but i feel like i'm probably not and <laughs> uh and all i i guess i i kind of see maybe why you guys may have suggested this mm-hmm. film and like what you what you like about this movie yep. but i feel like you really really need to tell me why you <laughs> like this movie because to me it was not that okay it was just it was just wasn't good like <laughs> not only was it not interesting yep. as like a thriller or like a, it just what it just. I didn't feel like it was very good. I just, I, 
What did you say? Mm-hmm. I, I I I don't I don't know what what the point of anything was. <laughs> I felt like I felt like uh, you know let, let me let, l- allow me to just kind of because I feel mm-hmm. like you guys are gonna have fucking responses for everything, mm-hmm. right? You're gonna have a reason I'm why. I'm curious like, by this reaction here. I want to hear about I, hear more. Here's about how it. I felt about Had the you movie. Seen it before? I'd never seen it before, but Sick. I've seen Same. I've seen Ace Ventura, so I knew what the twist was or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I don't even know if it's. Ah. I guess it. I guess it's a twist. And I was I was telling Katie mm-hmm. about this. I was telling her like, hey, I. I I feel like I missed something because of like mm-hmm. there has to be some sort of contextual information here mm-hmm. which validates this as the movie that that it is received as like mm-hmm. there has to be something there like maybe it's the time period it was released like the early 90s maybe it was you know I don't know the actors it was used I don't know what I don't mm-hmm. know what but I know there has to be some sort of information there because <laughs> I feel like no, that's I'm right I know that. exactly <laughs> what you're doing. I know what you're doing I feel like uh, I feel like two things. Mm-hmm. One is if you had removed the uh, transgender mm-hmm. storyline, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. it would have been like an average to below average thriller. And then mm-hmm. if you add the transgender thing back in, uh-huh. it plays no role in the movie or the plot other than for Fergus to be like, what the fuck is going on in my life right oh, now? I, dis- I, I disagree with wait, that. Wait, wait. Like, I think it could be, it could, yeah, yeah. that could easily have been just, I could easily have not been yeah. a twist in the movie. That's, and yeah. it wouldn't make the movie any better or no, worse. I want to hear, Ch- hear Chase's take. Chase seems like he has a <clears throat> differing opinion on this, but I, go ahead. So I think the, the transgender thing was definitely necessary mm. because it was like, for Fergus, it's at first he's like, Whoa, I'm going to puke. But secondly, he's like, I was kind of into it. Yeah. Kind of into it. This is like, perfect like i can go out and not get ridiculed about being with the dude mm-hmm. but low-key i'm still getting like dude I'm stuff getting, getting <laughs> stuff. you know what i mean uh <laughs> but so here, here's the thing i think w- the, and here's another element i think just to start i think that there is an element of context surrounding the film which is uh that that is not or at the time it was released that probably needs to be appreciated but i don't think it's essential for the film to be appreciated, which is this was coming out in a time when there still was a lot, or we're coming out of the time when there was a lot of trouble between Ireland and England, and the IRA and uh, and English troops were actually fighting and blowing each other up and killing each other like crazy. So it loads into it the idea that this isn't a random kidnapping for money that sets the whole thing. It's basically two people on opposite sides of a conflict who are basically uh, at sort of blood odds with each other. Now you also add a racial component in there because... Irish people at the, were thought to be very racist against black people, and they were at the time, and pres- presumably still are. I have no idea. Shout out to Ireland. Probably. Probably. So it's basically two people who are on opposite sides of this conflict in Forrest Whitaker and Stephen Ray's, uh, in Stephen Ray's characters, who... When, after they kidnap him, they begin to kindle a relationship. They begin to ki- they begin to find empathy for one another. And what actually really happens, I think, in this is that more so than just falling in love, more so than just becoming friends, there's kind of an actual love or a bond that forms between the two of them. I he does sure. he yeah. does hold his wiener. Yes, he holds right. his wiener. Pleasure exactly. was all his. I felt yes. like uh, that was very funny. I felt like it was like a meet cute, like in in a different movie. Yes, exactly. it Could have felt like a, exactly. a total and I think meet it very cute. Much, and what I think it very cue? much was a meet cute is the moment in a romantic comedy when uh, the handsome guy and the attractive girl you know bump into each other and sparks fly or they ah. have an argument but it's underlying the sexual tension underlies that you know it's sort of like one of those sorts of things now yeah. but here's the thing here is where what here's where the movie is interesting is that the what what constitutes the first 40 minutes of the film which is this story between these two characters is like a whole movie unto itself. Yes, it is. And then when that comes to a very abrupt end, and I think we're in spoiler territory here, when Forrest Whitaker's character dies or is killed, by a truck, yeah, murked. Then, every t- then the rest of the movie is a lot of the film beginning to sort of deal with, unpack all of Stephen Ray's feelings about this thing. His allegiance to one side of a conflict 
and all of his conflicted feelings, not just about feeling empathy for someone who is on the other side of this conflict, but feeling affection for someone who is on the other side of this conflict, and what does this mean for him? And he's obviously full of a lot of feelings of guilt. Now, the feelings of guilt are there on the surface, which is why he goes to see Dill, which is why he strikes up this relationship. But at the same time, he is through this relationship with Dill, beginning to try and explore these feelings, these feelings that he himself was trying to resist uh, when he had this relationship with Forrest Whitaker. Now, what's interesting about this is that I think that that in itself could have been, and likely, I'm guessing, was the plot probably a plot element that occur- first occurred to uh, Neil Jordan or the writer of this film. I don't remember who was that. 100%. Neil Jordan. Neil, really. Neil Jordan was the writer of this film. You could see like a very noirish plot where a guy kills a guy. You know, he says, bring this to my girlfriend. He goes, he, uh, he, uh, he meets the girlfriend. Uh, he falls in love with her, but he has this dark secret. You could see this very noirish plot uh, taking place. What is interesting is that the, the fact that uh, Dill is, as he refers to her in a very doesn't fly in our woke era, as not a woman, uh, as he finds out later, initially seems, yes, exactly, initially <laughs> throws him for a really big loop. But what, where that goes in the last 10 minutes of the film, where that goes in the last 15 minutes of the film mm-hmm. is really interesting because it, you, Neil Jordan utilizes this turn, uh, this kind of subversion of that expectation, and he utilizes it to make the subtext text in the movie where quite literally Dill, he cuts off, in order to sneak Dill away from the people, like the literal ghosts, the literal demons from his past that represent the other side of this political strife and Miranda Richardson's character and the other people who are coming to kill him. Also it, represents female sexuality, which yes, he needs to get away which from. Which he also that needs to get away that from. Ass, there you go. Forget that. But no. in order to, basically in order to, he is that Dill basically becomes Forrest Whitaker. He cuts her hair off so that she looks again, like reveals the fact that she you know was a man he puts her in Forrest Whitaker's clothes so these things that were subtextual become actually literal so now this guy who he kind of fell in love with at the beginning of the film he has recreated and again there's a lot of references there to things like Hitchcock's Vertigo where he feels a lot of guilt about one woman and then he falls in love with another woman and he dyes her hair blonde and then eventually kind of turns Turns this new woman into the woman he loved. Well, it's that, but it's in this weird gender inverted way where you have this guy who kidnaps another guy, you know, kind of falls in love with him in a platonic sense, you know, and then ends up killing him and racked with feelings of guilt. He didn't goes and meets, him. didn't kill, that's right. He didn't actually kill him. And then he begins to deal with those feelings of guilt by basic, by ultimately turning that woman back into the man he fell in love with in the first place. And then inverts into a climax where basically Forrest Whitaker is holding the gun on him yep. and all of that. And she's dressed as, uh, she's dressed as, uh, Forrest Whitaker. She's in his uh, his uh, his uh, whatever uh, 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 cricket outfit. Cricket, cricket outfit. outfit. Yeah, there you go. Tennis. She's in his cricket outfit, and and White now sweater. it's like Forrest, basically this ghost, and that's why in that last scene you're seeing <laughs> Dill not fully exposed, but you see Dill through that sheet of that uh, like muslin or whatever it is, that fabric. So there's a silhouette there, and Dill is seen in silhouette, basically dressed as Forrest Whitaker, pointing the gun through the fabric. So you can't even really see Dale's face. Miranda Richardson comes in, who of course was the evil bitch who was the most cruel to Forrest Whitaker. The tits and ass that trapped him and Forrest Whitaker's vengeful ghost now in the form of her boom, boom, boom shoots uh, Miranda Richardson down. And it's just really cool and gorgeous and I just love how all of those elements that were just really kind of provocative and edge, like really kind of pushing the vanguard at that time are actually used to kind of take subtext and make it text and take themes and bring them to light in a bunch of interesting ways that kind of parallel what Hitchcock did in Vertigo, but in a way that is completely new and and completely of the time that they were in. And I think all that's really fucking interesting and cool. And it's kind of a miracle that it all holds together as a movie, you know? And what I noted this time is how, it's been a while since I've seen it, but how funny it is and self-aware mm-hmm. it is first of all besides opening with when a man loves a woman yes. uh and, and closing, closing with, with a man saying stand, stand, man by, your man. stand by your man this would not there. fly today yes it is uh part of, uh, and this kyle actually pointed this part out in terms of the difference between how stephen ray's character 
uh, is written versus how he comes across because Stephen Ray portrays him, but having a lot of fun at Fergus's expense yeah. for being such a naive doofus when he yeah. has all the clues in the world put before him yeah. uh, and isn't picking up on it because he's thick and naive. And yeah, Kyle was pointing this yeah. out the other I think day. That Fergus, yeah, I think that Fergus is... Done, is and this is maybe... Uh, I don't know if I would consider this a flaw because I think Stephen Ray was really great in that role. But I think that Stephen Ray as an actor conveys an intelligence that it's I don't... It's in the eyes. In the eyes that I don't think that the character on the page was supposed to have. I think the character on the page, you can kind of see it in the beginning. And he, when Forrest Whitaker is like, goodbye, Fergus and the guy looks at him he's like he knows your name now and he's like I told him <laughs> you know and he's just he's he ta- he's he's kind of the doofus he's kind of the dummy of that mm. group and then at every other time everyone's leaning in and saying you know there's something funny about that lady and he's like what and he's just and there's a lot of jokes per- and or like when he's oh, watching it- the cricket match and he's like just holding a stick and he's like pretending to play cricket like he's a little kid watching and by the, the way match. I did love how in the gay bar when he goes to the gay bar uh, and it is obviously a gay bar when he's uh, having that first interaction mm-hmm. with Dill all the gay stuff you it's never at the focus at the center of yep. frame it's always on the edges of the frame yep. there because it's, it's, te- it's there yeah it's there but yep. you don't he doesn't acknowledge it because we never see a glance object cut to any gay exactly. stuff. We never see anything folks on set of frame. You see lots of gay stuff going on the periphery and gay nightclub music and going on. I didn't catch any of it. Totally yeah. oblivious to yeah. it. I didn't there. see any of it. Because the sit- because <laughs> Neil Jordan keeps you in, in his world. So it's there at the periphery, but we're just on the two characters. Then immediately after the big reveal, he walks into the bar and he kind of he's, and they it's don't like, right. he walks in and he yeah. like sees how what and you're he using, missed yes and you're time. seeing right. all but the things on the like, edge oh, of the frame shit. are now dead center. Yeah. It's like oh whoa and now the camera is not pointed at our characters but it's occupying Stephen Ray's POV so it doesn't doesn't really play it for a joke but he walks in and now we're in his POV as we scan around and there's a lot of dudes in wigs and there's a lot of people dressed oddly and we've been to this bar it's like our fourth time going to the bar in the movie and the first, uh, time, I realized, yeah, and the first time it's like really uh, obvious and in focus what the whole thing is and I think that's one of those the elements of his character the bartender's a champ yeah, oh yeah oh yeah he's, he's the best my favorite character <laughs> yes. Cole yes. Yes. Jim Broadbent is the man we should watch Without Hot Fuzz. Uh, also, uh, Fergus, right? Fergus? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pretty good fighter for being dumb. Yeah. Does it maybe? Oh, yeah. I think he was supposed to be just the dumb, tough guy. Yeah, That's pretty like much. Yeah, Ray, yeah. You know? like, almost broke that dude's neck. He delivers the mm-hmm. best. With his foot. He delivers the one of my favorite tough guy lines of all time, which is on, their, on the construction site. And uh, the guy calls uh, Dill a tart, and he stands up and says, you ever pick your teeth up with broken fingers? Oh, dude, that's so good. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the guy like goes back, and I I have said that to myself in that accent about forty five times a month since uh, <laughs> since I saw Crying Game ten that years ago. That is more ago. than twice a day. Yes, twice a day. About twice a day. Whenever I'm mad, I say to myself, "You ever pick your teeth up with broken fingers?" You know, and to uh, that's a good, that's yes, a good Irish to accent myself, <laughs> about myself. Yeah. I'm going to punch yeah. myself and, uh, so hard, <laughs> and I uh, I'm going to break my hand <laughs> and, and my, my teeth. teeth. Mm-hmm. And my other hand is uh, going to be occupied by going. Oh, I can't understand why I did that. So yeah. it's the broken hand that has to pick your teeth exactly. up. Exactly, yeah, of course. But yeah, I don't know, man. Like I, find, I, you know, it, it sucks if you like. I can totally understand not connecting with the movie because it is a very, very weird movie. But I feel like if you can get on its wavelength. It's one of those things that it's funny and weird and exciting and sad and then um, and ultimately just very, very kind of uplifting in the weird kind of peace that him and Dill find at the end of the movie. I don't know. It really She's works. She's bringing him vitamins in prison after yes, all. that's right. Uh, and and it's, also one of the, the days. Yeah, it's also one of those movies that you can watch an unlimited number of times and still see new stuff in it there. Mm-hmm. I've seen that movie, I don't know two dozen times which I've seen many movies more times than that but again every time it's like I'm watching a new movie mm-hmm. and seeing entirely new things in it because there's mm-hmm. that much stuff going on I, yeah, yeah. I, I I don't agree with it not being interesting I thought it was super like engaging and interesting like once once that dynamic between Fergus and mm. uh, Forrest Dill, Whitaker, or Forrest Whitaker yeah. started I was like ah oh, shit I gotta pay attention to this now <laughs> That yeah. I, that part I I found I found the structure of the movie to be um, really interesting, mm-hmm. right? Because they spend so much time setting up that relationship mm-hmm. between yeah, yeah. Uh, Fergus and Jody, mm-hmm. and I was I found that like I, the, a lot of that made sense to me immediately. Oh, mm-hmm. there's there's Jody, and then there's Jude, and mm-hmm. Jude is a bit of an asshole, and yeah, she's yeah. gonna murder everybody, and yeah, it's like yeah. really fucking clear from the get go that every character 
hates women, like yep. hates the thing that that Jude is, mm-hmm. and Jude is like this vixen who uses her sexuality to mm-hmm. you know trap men and then kill them or yeah. ruin everything that they are. And Def- definitely no fault of Forrest Whitaker yeah. at all. Right, right. And so, uh, and so, I, I guess in a, in a strange way, like that was interesting to me because I felt like watching this movie and knowing it was like an hour and forty five minutes or whatever mm-hmm. it is, and then forty minutes in, we're still with this setup, which would have mm-hmm. been like two fucking scenes if this movie came mm-hmm. out last week. Yeah. It's like, oh, like this is important. I yeah, I yeah. got that, and I liked that part yeah, of it, yeah. and I I thought overall, like, okay, we're setting up for obviously what is going to be happening yeah, over yeah. the next couple acts of this movie, and uh, and then it it completely it just like it just completely lost me. I was like, mm-hmm. all right, well, like. I kind of feel like I see where this is going to go, mm-hmm. like how this is going to resolve itself. And I just didn't, it did not catch me from that point Interesting. on. Like I thought it was, I thought it was, I thought the meet cute between Fergus and Dill was really, in, was like, you know, cute, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like they go to, then she's talking to him through Cole. And like, that's cool. Like that's fine. But it just didn't, I just didn't resonate. I was like, what is going on here? Like mm-hmm. this movie, if you remove what to me is like the most flashy portion of the mm-hmm. movie, it, falls into like an average thriller category. Well, here's the thing is that understand understand this, that like when I when I say that a movie, when I say that I really like a movie or I, I think that a movie is great, I you have to look at, I, I have to take the whole of the movie as a, th- as a thing. Like I, I cannot, like if you say you, like if you remove the Forrest Whitaker part of the film or this or that, or if you remove the transgender element, like not any one element of many movies, of many many movies, can stand up to infinite scrutiny, and nor does it need to, in my mind, stand up to infinite scrutiny for me to call a great a movie a great movie. There's all sorts of criticisms I can have of any number of individual elements within the movie. Like obviously, the actress that plays Dill isn't the best actress in the world. Obviously, I think a lot of how the the, the final plot thing to get to where it needs to get symbolically is a little clunky. I think there's all sorts of things that are prob- that 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 just are you know either kind you know a kind of vary between kind of good to mediocre about the execution level uh, about execution level elements of many different aspects of the film but not a single one of those things in any way in my mind detracts from the greatness of the movie or my ability to say I still think it is a great movie because the movie is the whole of those elements put together the movie is the fact that it is a 40 mi- that it has like a 40 minute uh, basically short film between Stephen Ray and Forrest Whitaker in the beginning that then te- sets us up for a noir plot that takes place but wherein one of the characters is transgender that then turns into that transgender character, you know, becoming Forrest Whitaker in the final moments of the film Mm -hmm. to kill Miranda Richardson. Like, that's the movie. And it's like, it it would be like saying, you know, uh, well, that wouldn't, that building wouldn't be so tall if you cut the top half off of it. You know, it's like, well, that's the building. It's, it is that tall. And so I, I 100% agree. There's lots of things in the movie that I think can be criticized, but what I think Sound design wasn't great. Sound design wasn't great. Why was there no sound when he's busting that brick out of the thing? I know, that still bothers me. It bothers me. Um, But, uh, think about it. Yeah, but it's the kind of thing (laughs) that bothers people who have to add sound into shit for a living um but uh but anyway yeah it's just it's one of those things that the really unique relationship between all of those elements and like how far out and like where did this come from and yet in my mind they all work so well and complement each other so well it is such a wholly unique movie that works and works completely on its own terms. Uh, and I just, and I love that about it. Like, I think I, I mean, when I was young, like the, all, a lot of, uh, I was going to the whole path, but even other things like the fact that it co-ops elements of vertigo or any of these things went completely over my head when I was a kid. And yet I still just dug the movie on, on the level of it being a thriller. And now I, I don't know. So it's like, if you take the movie on its own terms, I just, I think it's great. I think that it, I think there's nothing like it, you know? So like Heat, mm-hmm. mm. this movie is also basically what Christopher Nolan used to make a Dark Knight movie because this is Dark Knight Rises, right? Oh, is it? Yeah, How is that? character uh-huh. falls in love with Bane. Nice. Mm. Gets his back broken, but lets Bane live, runs mm-hmm. away then falls in love with not Bane's girlfriend, the other chick. Yes. Who was the other chick in Bark Dark Knight Rises that woman? stabs him in the back? Yep. Oh, uh, you mean that's Mar- like the Mary, reveal. Mary and Cody. Talia Al Ghul or something. In yeah. the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Can't believe it. 
That's how we tied it all well, together. We should, we should, though, talk about how there's a similar relationship between uh, Heat to Dark Knight, uh, to, the, to the Dark Knight, uh, and this and Ace Ventura. Of <laughs> course. Detective. Because not just, not just Same the... Same movie. Not just, Same the, movie. Uh, not just the, the, the whole Wiener thing, which factors into it, but, of course, the actual song the crying game plays yes. during that whole sequence yes. in, the, uh, in the Ace Ventura not, sequence. Not so. to mention just the fact that the whole notion that the, 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 the plot twist in Ace Ventura is about realizing that the man is the woman and the woman is a man in, pl- in disguise. Finkel is and Einhorn. Einhorn, Einhorn is, is Finkel. Finkel. By the way, if you're ever watching Crying Game with someone, a good way to get a laugh, and I did this last night, was right around the time he's figuring it out. I just went, Finkel, Einhorn, Einhorn, Finkel. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know the movie that references The Crying Game, which I watched dozens of times as a child mm-hmm. and only now saw the sort of like you know how you get you get like this imprint in your mm-hmm. brain mm-hmm. and only later as an adult do you sort of recognize it happening in the moment um so i remember watching it, it happened during the scene where there's the big reveal right so mm-hmm. dill leaves and she goes and changes yeah, yeah and you kind of see her approaching through that like muslin sheet around yeah, yeah. the bed and uh there's a scene almost exactly like that in one of the Naked Gun movies. Oh, <laughs> it like headlight tits or something weird. Uh, like, or no, it isn't. She, uh, there might be headlight yeah. tits in that, but the the joke, the scene in that one plays out very similar to this. The crying yeah. game. They're making out on the bed. It's covered in like the muslin thing, and then you know the girls like it's like a much more like flamboyantly female woman, uh-huh. right? She's like a. I'm sure she was like a playmate or something. They like, you know. Well, yeah, I think Anna Nicole Smith. Oh, yeah, Anna Nicole Smith, Smith. Anna Anna Nicole Smith, Smith has a dick in that one. And she I has remember. a dick. She, you see her shadow as she like takes off her clothes to oh, put on. Oh, I don't remember that part. Drawer. Of it. She like and takes you see off the, her clothes. See the shadow and this, like, of the dick, curved, and it's like a curved, this, like, dick, yeah. curved <laughs> erection just comes out of nowhere, and he starts vomiting. And I remember as a kid thinking, <laughs> man, that's really funny and gross. Like, why is that so crazy? And then this in this movie, when when he when they're making out, and Dill's like, hold on one second. I'm gonna get more comfortable and like walks away and I was like oh my god I'm gonna see the shadow of this of Dill's dick right now because that's what I got mm-hmm. primed for I was like oh Naked Gun primed me for yeah, this yeah. movie as an 8 year old as it turns out you did not see the shadow of no I penis. saw I saw directly you fully saw the penis, the penis um, which was you know really made my day uh, you get full penis in this movie mm-hmm. so you know I and that was that was uh, <laughs> I was aware of what the twist was. Obviously, Chase was not. No. Uh, Chase oh, was really? Really? Off guard. So Chase, yeah. I had no no idea. Well, I, so I'm you, assuming you picked up along the way. Yeah, because no. we had. Oh, okay. let's, let's, let's no pause. Stop, I, I stop the presses. Stop this is important. The stop the presses. This is the whole. I don't. Have, why are Everything we talking about, about this, this now? Get, yes. Yes. Okay. So. <laughs> Part of the reason, obviously, to get people to watch this, see, is there anyone around who doesn't know the twist? And if so, yeah. how, when do they figure it out and all that? So, yeah. Chase, N- tell us, us your, your experience. experience. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> I, 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 haven't, I haven't seen, like, mm-hmm. I've seen Ace Ventura, but I was a little yeah, kid, yeah, so yeah. I, don't, I didn't retain anything about it. Yeah, yeah. So, I didn't know what the twist was that you guys were talking about. But I'm watching the movie, mm-hmm. and I was just like, ah, like, okay well he has like this lover that he was married to or, or mm-hmm. whatever back home and then like the whole time like from the time you meet her mm-hmm. i was like man she has like a really like masculine face <laughs> and voice yeah i was like i don't i don't know though like whatever to each their own definitely whenever this movie was made they wouldn't talk about stuff like that <laughs> so i like went ahead and i was like no way they do that type of uh-huh. stuff whenever this movie is made and then when Chase it happened, is like, hmm, subtext. Yes. There's definitely a hint. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and 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 to, and to Chase, like the the '90s might as well be 1965. So, so he yeah. wasn't born in either of them. Yes, so. exactly. Yeah, so pretty much the moment that he's like in her house and she like and he's like reaches reaches down uh-huh. like yeah. the first time and she says no and, and she says no. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> There's something funny about that lady. <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, that's that's when I then I that's when you suspected. That's when you when suspected. I suspected, and then I didn't have full realization until the moment. I was oh, just like, that's awesome! That's awesome! So, like, oh. so, what was your what was your take <laughs> wow. on that scene? What was your take on that scene when this, it happened? Uh, this erection is real awkward now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what? <laughs> so wait. So what? What was your experience of that scene? So you're watching the scene. You know, Dill disrobes, and all of a sudden you, you have big old penis, like tilt down to a big old penis. Uh, what? So tell me, what was your reaction? Reaction in that moment. Well, my my reaction Eek, was there's like, a penis. 
I was like, ah, that was the first reaction. I was like, I'm glad I'm not in the office yet because that, hey, that is something for this generation. <laughs> oh, this is really funny oh, actually oh, because he, I, I told him, we, I told him yesterday. I was like, yeah, man, I just finished watching the movie, and then he goes, yeah, I'll try and low key watch it at the office. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, like don't do that I, no I, I didn't even I was like yeah that's cool whatever just watch it before the show tomorrow <laughs> so I I watched it while I was like getting ready in the morning yeah, yeah, yeah. making breakfast and whatnot, and driving to work so I'm like watching it while I'm sitting in oh, traffic safety. and Jesus. that that reveal happened just as I was getting off 35 <laughs> what yeah. alright so what you're like, watching ah. it on your phone while driving a car yeah it's your Jesus that's but the best way to the to things I do for appreciate know, for scale. Scale nation. don't ever yeah. do that guys please yeah. do that if oh, it involves man. your homework yes yeah <laughs> uh, so yeah but my my biggest reaction was like oh he he definitely is into her though because this is secretly what he wants because yeah. he goes in to Jody or Judy yeah I, mean, I, don't, I don't names are confusing Jody yeah yeah, yeah. And he didn't just run out the door. He just pukes <laughs> politely <laughs> in her kitchen <laughs> and sticks I, around. I do love that line later on when she was like, even when you were throwing up, up, I knew you cared. <laughs> it's very true. Those were some caring throw-ups. Those were some caring throw-ups, yeah. Because uh, if you really are like that yeah, yeah. freaked out, you split. I guess one thing that's really, uh, really stands out to me is this movie came out 26 years ago it was 92 right something mm-hmm. like that seems about right yeah Dang. and yeah. we have not had another movie like this since no and that to me is is probably the most fascinating thing about the whole deal like yeah. we haven't had a story like this told well, since yeah, then no, that's absolutely true i think though yeah that is that is true i think that what and this will be I'm, I'm gonna kind of curve this back around into a big compliment for the crying game uh brian de palma played in a lot of the same territory he did uh a lot of ref- stuff that was much more explicitly referenced uh alfred hitchcock he played with people um you know uh, like uh, with a lot of kind of or at least what would have been called at the time you know transvestite stuff which was loaded into a, you know like movies like psycho and then you know with uh, norman dressing up as his mother and he brought more of that sexuality more of that kind of stuff into his take on Hitchcock, but his stuff was still very much nested in Hitchcock's approach to some of those things where it's like men dressing as women, women dressing as men. That's kind of fucked up. They probably also kill people. (laughs) (laughs) And so when, you know, when Michael Caine or, 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 uh, or any one of the, or uh, what is it? Um, John uh, Lithgow. John Lithgow plays a transvestite in one of Brian De Palma's movies. They're also murderers. So when, but, and this is what we have, what's interesting with crying game is that he basically, Basically, he casts uh, a actually transgendered woman in 1992 to play uh, the uh, to play kind of the uh, the love interest uh, to play uh, you know in in, a, in that same type of movie, and then you know commits to that fully through the end of the movie, which is a just kind of crazy that 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 he was doing that in 1992. But what I think is more impressive is rather than there being this. And this is something that I try, that I love in movies. Rather than being this hard line between like pulpy movies that are actually fun to watch but lack any substance or anything interesting, and then over here we have art films that maybe could like there were plenty of films about gay people and transgender people in the '90s, but they were boring as fuck, and no one would ever want to watch them again because who gives a shit? Whereas, whereas it was like Crying Game by contrast, is a film that is pulpy and visceral and exciting to watch, which is why people still watch it to this day and was dealing with all of that shit at the same time. And therefore, I think it transcends uh, a lot of the other films at the time, which would have done the same issues, but been fucking tedious and boring. Well, there's a whole other version of this movie where uh, that deals with much of the same subject matter, but... The more standard execution would not involve the IRA terrorist mm-hmm. plot, would not involve yeah, yeah. much killing or thriller stuff, yeah. where it would just deal kind of straightforwardly with these issues of sexuality, which would be okay, but we wouldn't be talking about it today. It wouldn't be a fun, entert- as nearly as fun, entertaining, engaging a movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think a- if today uh, they tried to make The Crying Game, um, they'd cast Scarlett Johansson. 
<laughs> get it? Get it? We're uh, full as, as Fergus, they would cast as Scarlett Johansson as uh, as uh, Yoshi Hirohito, a Japanese <laughs> in World woman. War Two, <laughs> taking place in World War Two, a POW. I hate to say it, but I didn't hate it. Mm. Goddamn right, you didn't hate it because it's a great fucking movie. Yeah, Bones. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I'm 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 okay no. with I listen. I didn't say you was I'm man. not intellectual. You don't get it. I'll s- I will say this. I will say this. Giannis I just would have got it. Yeah. So I will say this. I'm not trying to convince Armin that it's a great movie. But what I will try and say about the movie is that you know, hopefully, you know, just kind of like look. I can understand being like kind of bouncing off the surface of some issues with its execution, some issues with some of the performances and that sort of thing. But maybe it's like if you can kind of calibrate yourself to its wavelength a little bit more, I think that it's a film that has a lot of depth and a lot of humor and a lot of other things that once you kind of get in that vibe, you can, for instance, I would say this. If you were watching three movies in a row, you watched two movies prior to that that also were from the same time period, maybe two other Neil Jordan movies, like you're watching Mona Lisa or something else prior to that you were kind of vibing on that era the style of performance etc and then you went into this movie and you were kind of calibrated already for the level of execution that you were going to expect I think you probably would have loved the movie a lot more but it's like especially when we're coming off of seeing something like Heat which albeit from a similar time is a Hollywood film with a much higher uh, production value much higher level execution you can kind of bounce off those surface elements a little bit and have a, a harder time bridging the gap between yourself and the characters so I would say that I think that's the kind of movie that maybe if you warm to some of the surface level stuff you might find a lot more in yeah. later on and yeah I can only recommend seeing this movie many 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 more times because I've seen it way over way over 20 times mm-hmm. and uh, 24 God oh yeah right. exactly double dozen exactly and there is always new stuff in it there yeah there's oh. just pay attention to how pay attention to how dumb and oblivious Fergus is throughout the whole movie about everything, for example. By the way, I was thinking about this the other day, and I think it's relevant. <laughs> yeah, it's Chase, like, oh. Chase, Chase would have fucked the shit out of Dill. Um, yeah, dude. Yeah, like all like, up Wait, in is that your dick or my dick? Yeah. I'm so confused right now. Uh, and turned on. Yeah, it's so I'm too polite uh, to say no. <laughs> <laughs> Just, Chase is like, okay, well, this is what we're doing now, I guess. So it's I, like... I, <laughs> It's like I've been too polite to say anything. We've been sleeping together for six weeks. Uh, <laughs> um, but Cole, I think there's something strange about Dill. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I wanted can't to bring quite this up. Put my finger on it. <laughs> I wanted to bring this up because it was actually the reason we talked about the crying game uh, on the podcast well over a year ago was my experience of the crying game was very specific to hello loki is very specific to the era and and i think it's something that um to an era that doesn't exist anymore and streaming has kind of eliminated which is my experience was turning on television in the middle of the crying game and just beginning to watch the movie at a random point now when i would turn on the movie uh, the first couple times I turned on the movie, uh, it was uh, the first couple times I turned on the movie. I was in the middle of the Forest Whitaker sequences of the movie, and Forest Whitaker had been kidnapped by Stephen Ray. They're having this whole moment. It builds to a huge climax where, in slow motion, it appears that everyone, including Forest Whitaker, who was the only star who I recognized at the time, uh, dies. And so I thought to myself. This must be the end of the movie. Mm-hmm. I must have come because this was this was pre digital cable, so you couldn't be like, oh, this movie right. has what an hour left it? in it. Yeah, okay, I guess so you're done. just fucking watching the movie. So I thought, oh well, that was the climax of the movie. Three and then five p.m. That's a weird exactly. time to be over. <laughs> yes, but th- oh well, remember the old TV in old TV days, things started at whatever fucking time. Like yeah, especially these, with the HBO. Yeah, and things stuff. did not start cleanly on the hour, um, but. Uh, and so I remember, like, he, all of a sudden, he, his hair's cut off. He's, he's living in London. He's a construction worker. I'm expecting that this is the, just the denouement of the, the movie. The beginning of the movie? Yeah, no, no, no. I, no, no, no. I'm thinking that's the very end of the movie. Denouement. The, sorry, something. the denouement means the, ver- means the post-climactic ah, coda to the okay. film. So I figure, oh, he's working as a construction worker. This is his life after the movie. And that pretty soon we're going to, uh, pretty soon we're going to see him, you know, the credits roll. You know, and then... He goes and he meets this girl, and then this, and other things happen, and I had to discover the fact that there's a whole another movie after the movie, (laughs) and that, in fact, everything with Forrest Whitaker wasn't, in fact, me coming in 
40 minutes before the movie ended, but I probably came in very near the beginning. And so there was this amazing sense of discovery, I think, and it, as would often happen, these films would be playing on TV frequently and you would just pop in and out of them at random you know because like if, if on that particular month showtime was playing movies so you would just uh do we need to change something? no you're good oh cool uh they would just be playing all the time and so uh i probably I'm, i think and i think this is the case i think i probably watched the forest whitaker section and then after forest whitaker died and everything got blown up probably just changed the channel and then like dipped into it again later same forest whitaker section and then discovered upon my like second viewing that oh, in shit. fact there was a, a whole, whole more movie yeah. left to go you, you know, know they some another movie recently tried to do the whole hey there's a whole second movie after this movie is mm -hmm. over and that movie is called the last jedi and it failed miserably <laughs> at making that happen yeah so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think that was a trend that caught on. No, Ryan Johnson. Yeah, no, that uh, that's a whole different thing. That's like that's when you say we got to stick around uh, to really wrap things up with these characters, but you forgot to make anyone give a shit about any of the <laughs> characters. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. So I guess listen. I I think one of the things that I was looking forward to this conversation mm. was I I I'm not I'm not looking to be turned or convinced of anything around my experience of this movie uh -huh. what i was hoping for is exactly what i got yeah, yeah. which was this explanation of the context of the the structure of like how outstanding the structure of mm -hmm. the film is in its own way like written in a way that that sort of blends all these different themes and the context and the subtext becomes you know like apparent it like bubbles up from below mm -hmm. and like you know becomes an actual Thing. set pieces at the very end of the movie and that is to me it's like even if i didn't necessarily enjoy watching this mm -hmm. thing i can respect that there is this like craft behind its uniqueness and how it's able to put these things together because that's really fucking hard mm -hmm. like that's it's if it was easy there would be a lot of movies who were doing that. Yes, and that's and that's actually a really that's actually a really good point because I think that especially we live in an era where people are really obsessed with uh, s with a lot of surface level detail in movies. I think especially you know young generations are watching fucking cinema sins videos and they're saying like that that performance was corny or this thing. It's like what makes a movie like a film can be cast with bad actors, for instance, and. Uh, I'm not saying that about crying game, but can be cast with bad actors or have shoddy execution or all have a myriad flaws across the surface. But what makes a good a movie good or not is in its bones. It's it's in the the it's in like the big uh, undertones, the big primary colors that underlie the rest of the movie. That's what makes a movie that that really is. And if a film is pristine on the surface uh, in its execution, uh, sometimes, but its bones are flawed. That's which is and by that I basically mean there's nothing interesting fundamentally about the conceit of this film or the ideas that it's playing with or any of the things it's creating, and it's just derivative of other films, yada yada yada. Then who gives a shit how well it executed it is, how well the craft is, the fact that there are no plot holes, the fact that X performance is good or bad, like these things are, are don't matter, and crying is one of those films that the bones are so interesting that it transcends every other element well, of the film. This also, this category that you're talking about, in a much more extreme form, falls into most of the movies that I like, most of my favorite movies there, where, you know, I don't know, some of my favorite movies, like Night of the Demons or Friday the 13th Part 3, yeah. you know, all of the acting is bad. Yeah. It's poorly shot. Uh... Nothing the special makes sense. effects are bad. <laughs> the plot doesn't make there's sense. There's no logic behind anything. But there's just something. There's just special energy going on there, man. Yeah. And uh, this would be frequently. Uh, we went to QT <laughs> Fest. That's a lot harder to. Yeah. What? Yeah, when, when, at, <laughs> at QT Fest, you know, it was yeah. when Quentin Tarantino came and showed some of his favorite movies. That'd be frequently his introduction to you know some of the movies he's showing us there. It's like, okay, 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 okay. So the movie has really bad production values, and the director is kind of asleep, and kind of there's non-professional actors and all that but there's one thing that really i don't know makes this kind of special you know what 
he was usually right. Yeah, and, but the thing is, and I really honestly believe that those are the things that last. I'm not like, for, for instance, everyone right now is really obsessed with the Mission Impossible. I'm not going to like beating up a Mission Impossible. I think they're fine. But I think there's no, because there's no interesting bones to any of the recent, even the last two Mission Impossible movies, they are pristinely executed movies that you completely forget about. Like there are references to Mission Impossible 5 and Mission Impossible, in Mission Impossible 6. I didn't know, I can't, I saw that movie two years ago and I've forgotten the entirety of that well, movie. Well, it's so, so forgettable that I saw Mission Impossible 5. Weeks before. Uh, I saw Mission Impossible yeah. 5 oh, when right. it first came out, and then when the new one was coming out, I was like, did I see Mission Impossible 5? And I was convinced <laughs> that I hadn't. He actually told me he hadn't seen it. I hadn't it. seen it. I was convinced that I hadn't, and everyone, Paul, Paul at work was saying that, oh, you need to watch Mission Impossible 5 in order yeah. to get Mission Impossible 6. Okay, I'll, I'll rent, buy on iTunes or rent on iTunes Mission Impossible 5. And I was about 20 minutes into it, and I was wait a second, did I see this movie? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I saw this whole movie, and I'm 20 minutes into it now, and only now beginning to remember it. Pristinely executed, utterly forgettable and meaningless. Yeah. No one will be playing that at repertory screenings 30 years from yeah. now. Whereas there are some movies that are flawed on the surface, and yet the bones are so interesting. Those are the things that last, the things that stick in your mind, the things that come back to you again and again and again. I can remember shitty little like pulp books that I like like for kids that I read when I was 12 because it was like one interesting thing in the plot of the book that stuck in my head ever since then little movies from my from you know childhood that I'm sure uh, the, the, on the surface are garbage now but there's just something interesting in the premise or whatever it is and so yeah that's the big that's definitely one of the, the obsession we now seem to have with the surface of films and their execution level things or how many cinema sins they've committed or are there plot holes or is, is the this it's a it completely what frustrates me about it is it completely misses the point because films that high that score high in those dimensions do not necessarily that does not necessarily correlate in any way to is a film actually good and what makes a film good is are the guts of it interesting you know soul. does that stick with you is the soul interesting yes that's that's the thing. So that's my rant on that. And the cr- yeah, bless pleasure, you. pleasure, bless And the you. crying game is only a mild version of this because the crying game is very well executed, albeit with some roughness around the edges. Yeah, yeah. But with the soul, that's about as deep as a movie can get there. So that's yeah. the crying game near the top. Friday the Thirteenth Part Three, also one of those really great movies. And I complete, I completely agree with him on Friday. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I've I've never seen I've never seen that one. Is that Dream Dream Warriors? That's uh, no, no, that's that's Nightmare on Elm Street Part Three. See, I don't even know. But you were you're 100 percent right. By the way, you're 100 percent right. Uh, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street Part Three is Dream Warriors. And speaking of that, another really uh, another really great movie. Frank Darabont actually worked on the script. And keep in mind, this is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. You'll often find this crazy thing that happens where you'll look at a movie that you just really remember from when you were a kid and you can't tell why and the and the acting is not great or whatever but sometimes you'll find like oh a really great writer like Frank Darabont was working on that which meant that under that surface in the bones in the soul of the movie there was someone who's trying to do something interesting which is why when other things fade out of my mind, I'll never forget that in Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3, you know, it's a fundamentally about some fucked up teenagers who, when they go into their dreams, uh, it, have superpowers that reflect their insecurities in life. And they use those superpowers in the dream world to fight Freddy Krueger. And, like, it, that's such an interesting idea that it doesn't matter that half of them can't act and it's not necessarily the best executed film in the world. Actually, it's still a pretty well executed film. But still, like, that shit sticks with you, you know, can, and stuff. So. Can I make a suggestion yes. for our next movie? I don't know the exact I, I'm not I don't know exactly what movie we should watch but I'm I'm trying to find an interesting way for us to spin this because I think there are a lot of movies that we can mm. suggest that maybe are left of you know the existing here's like oh the, the Shawshank Redemptions of the world right like there isn't there's only yeah, so yeah. much that we can talk about how, <laughs> like okay it's great it's one it's great it's fantastic yeah. we know right yeah um, but what if but what, what if this, this hmm. What if we what if we started picking more modern movies, movies that are built inside of this this context of the world we now live in mm-hmm. when it comes to movies, which is instead of there being like straight to DVD 
or straight to TV movies. Mm-hmm. Now they're just straight to Netflix movies. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What if we picked a Netflix movie that none of us have seen oh, yeah. and watched that? There's ample. Because <laughs> there are hundreds. I mean, they probably released six in the time that this podcast started. No, 100%. I think that that would be really cool. It'd be yeah. cool to go. My only, ca- the only asterisk there, and maybe this is more of an odd po- uh, off pod talk, is like sometimes when with a lot, with more movies than not, if it's uninteresting, there isn't that much to say about Correct. it. Like if, if it's a spooky house horror movie or something that we pick at random and I realize like, oh, most of this is just derivative from other spooky house horror movies and it's pretty well shot, pretty well executed and it's just sort of a product of its time, then we I can talk for maybe two minutes about it and then it's like I might run out of things. But I think that you're right. We should dive into something maybe that we all haven't seen and just sort of I think there's some I think there's a nugget there that yeah, we yeah. can we can polish. I think there's something there that we can figure out. Like watching a movie that none of us have seen that it's like it's more of a modern look. I yeah, think yeah. we can find something very interesting there. Dope. I like it. I like that idea. So we will get back to you, Scalas Nation, soon with Armin's pick for our next That's movie. That's right. I'm gonna do some research and I'm yeah. gonna find something. Hopefully I'll, I'll have a pick next week. Word. Bra, bra. That's right. Uh, so let's yeah, let's go and wrap this guy up. This has been really good. Well, I am at Mr. Kyle Bogart on the most sensual Instagram on, account on the internet where you can currently find lots of Instagramming associated with my new short film, Sprites, which will be premiering on Sunday as part of Fantastic Fest here in Austin, Texas. I'm at Cliff Bogart on an Instagram account, and I was there when Sprites was made. Sure was. <laughs> I'm at Chase504 yep, on Instagram. We do this every episode, Chase. And I had nothing to do with Sprites or uh, Fantastic Fest. Can Is there any way people can watch Sprites, Kyle? Uh, I'm going to try and get this one online faster. than imp- It took like a year for me to get House of Straw online because we're still playing festivals. But when it does go online, uh, I will let everyone know. But if you want, you can go to Kyle Bogart's Vimeo page and watch my last short film, House of Straw, which I think has some interesting bones to it. People kind of like it. Yeah, it was really good. Yeah, so you can watch that to hold you over until Sprites is released on the internet. Yeah, so that, that's go to Kyle's Vimeo, Kyle Bogart, and watch House of Straw. It's very good. Um, and then you can call me a hypocrite for criticizing other movies so harshly, but not being able to make good movies myself. Or there you not. Go. That's, a good, that's a good move. You should start a YouTube channel where you do that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and you can find me at Arm & Hammer TV. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening and watching, and we will catch you next week. Later. Yeah.